So at this point, you may wish to pause the recording in order to read the problem statement and come up with your own method for a solution. Okay, so in this problem, we have two kilograms of steam inside a piston cylinder. It undergoes a constant pressure process, and we're asked to find all sorts of things. The work out of the system, the useful work out of the system, what the maximum amount of useful work out of the system could be for several different things, and then to compare all those uh, things to each other. And finally, we're going to revert back to the days of con apps and calculate the heat transfer in and out of the system, uh, use that with entropy accounting to calculate S-gen and the irreversibility, and compare that to everything that we've been doing previously. Okay, so pretty rich problem, so let's get started. So the first thing we're asked to do is find the work out of the steam during this process. Even though I didn't specifically ask for it, I hope that you were drawing phase diagrams, specifically the TS diagram, and probably more important in this problem, the PV uh, diagram. This is a constant pressure process. It starts out at state point 1, which is a saturated vapor, ends up at state point 2, constant pressure, quality, of 0.5. So we've discovered by drawing the PV diagram that not only is this constant pressure, it is also constant temperature. All right. And furthermore, the area underneath the curve on the PV diagram from 1 to 2, that is the work per unit mass, another real good reason that you might want to draw the PV diagram. So this is uh, Compression expansion work, and I can use this handy-dandy formula, the integral of PdV, to find that. Notice I don't have a negative sign here. Instead, I have a plus sign, or I should say that I neglected to put the minus sign because I'm working for the work out of the system. So work in is minus integral PdV. Work out is plain old integral PdV. This is a closed system. So I can take mass out of that by the integral of PD little v. And since it's constant pressure, I can take the pressure out and, and, and end up uh, integrating uh, dV. That's a really easy integral. So the final formula that I would use for the work out of the system is mass times the pressure at 1 times the change in specific volume. Mass is given. Pressure at 1 is given. And the two specific volumes I can find because I know two properties at state one and state two. Specifically, I know the pressure and quality at both state points. So finding those properties any way you like, as long as it's correct, you can plug those in and find the work out of this system. So notice I've skipped the steps, the calculation steps, just because we want to focus on the main um, ideas here. You'll often see me put equals and then a dot, 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 and then an equals again to show that I'm skipping steps. There's actually a name for that punctuation symbol. That's called an ellipsis. It means stuff was left out between here and here. Okay. So getting back on track here. The useful work out of the steam for the process. What was that? Well, notice that the work out of the process is negative. I ended up putting work into the system instead of getting work out. But when I talk about useful work out, I'm still going to approach this as if work were out of the system. So I'm going to subtract from the work out of the system the work that was done against the atmosphere. That's always pretty easy to calculate because all you have to do is take the pressure of the atmosphere itself, that's what P0 is, and multiply it by the change in volume of the system. Don't take the pressure of the system and multiply it by delta V. So even if this were not a constant pressure process, um, I could still, and in fact I should, calculate the work done against the atmosphere using P0 delta V. So that's not the pressure of the system, that is the pressure of the atmosphere. In any case, I've got everything I need for those, uh, that calculation, because I have the mass of the system, I've got delta V of the system, I have the pressure of the atmosphere. The work done against the atmosphere is minus 89.4 kilojoules, so that work is into the system also. And then when I, I combine them, the useful work out of the system is minus 87.7. So it doesn't look like it was as bad before. I was looking for how much work I could get out of the system and end up putting minus 177, uh, or I should say I ended up putting in 177 kilojoules to the system, so it's getting useful work out. But when I think about it in terms of useful work, 
Uh, I only had to put uh, a little under 90 kilojoules of work into the system to change from state point one to state point two. But either way, I'm not getting useful work out of the system. I'm having to put useful work into the system to go from one to two. Okay, so so far we've really focused on work and what useful work, what those quantities are, and how you would calculate them. Let's now talk about how much uh, useful work I could have gotten out of the system. To start out with, we're going to uh, find out how much useful work I could have gotten out of the system going from state point one, but rather than going from one to two, I go from one to the temperature and pressure of the environment. I let the system reach equilibrium with the environment. So when you see uh, me asking this particular question, hopefully you immediately think, Exergy, because this is really what the definition of exergy is. Exergy is the maximum amount of useful work you can get out of the system if you let that system reach equilibrium with the environment and it's only allowed to exchange heat with the environment. So I have one thing to calculate, and that is the exergy at state point one. To do that, I multiply the mass by the specific exergy at one, and then I plug in u1, u0, v1, v0, s1, and s0 in order to calculate the specific exergy at state point one. Okay, so let's be very clear about some of the things that go into this calculation. u1 refers to the specific internal energy of the steam at state point one. Oh, and by the way, you must use absolute temperature for uh, the T delta S calculation, just a heads up there. Um, U at state point zero, however, is U of the steam if it were in equilibrium with environment. In other words, that is U of the steam at T zero and P zero. It is not, let me emphasize that again, it is not the specific internal energy of the environment. It's the specific internal energy of your stuff if it were at the temperature and pressure of the environment. Very important distinction. So you still use the steam tables to find that. Okay, so I've got U1 is the U of the stuff at quality of 1, and the pressure is given. U0 is U of steam at 101 kilopascals and 300 kelvins. I look that up. And then I find V1, V0, S1, and S0. I find all of those the same way. And plugging and chugging, making use of my friend the ellipsis, I find that the exergy at state point one is just shy of 972 kilojoules. When I interpret this, I realize that had I gone from state point one to equilibrium with the environment, instead of going from one to two, I could have gotten out almost a megajoule worth of work out of this process. Instead, I went from one to two, and I had to put in work to make that happen. Okay, so let's do C2, which is to do the same calculation for the stuff at the final state. So once again, I really recognize that I uh, want the exergy. This is, again, kind of the definition of what exergy is. So if I had started at state point two and reached equilibrium with the environment and exchanged heat with only the environment, that would be the exergy. Uh, or the maximum useful work I could get out of that process would be the exergy. Okay, so I calculated the same way, M times little a2. Little a2 found the same way, I found little a1. I'll let you fill in the blanks. Once again, making use of my friend the ellipsis, I end up with 537 kilojoules that I could have gotten out of the system had it gone from 2 to 0. Okay? So finally, I've been asked to find what the maximum amount of useful work that could be extracted from the steam would be had I gone from one uh, to two, which is what I actually did. I actually went from one to two. I didn't go from one to the equilibrium with environment. I didn't go from two to equilibrium with environment. I went from one to two. Well, to find the maximum amount of useful work that could have uh, been extracted from the steam going from one to two, all I have to do is take the decrease in exergy in going from one to two. Okay, so it had this potential at one to do work. It had this potential at state point two to do useful work. The drop in that potential to do uh, useful work is the maximum useful work I could have gotten out of the system going from one to two.
Hopefully that makes sense. Here's where things get interesting. I've calculated both of those numbers, and I take the difference between the two, and I get 435 kilojoules. Had I done everything reversibly, going from 1 to 2, I could have gotten 435 kilojoules out of the system. Instead, I ended up putting in almost 90 kilojoules worth of work. Looks like I really screwed up. Okay, so to recap, the useful work out of the uh, system was negative. I put work in. The maximum amount that number can be is 435 kilojoules. This shows us where exergy is a really important and useful property. It tells us the potential that I could have uh, to create useful work. And I, had I only done the calculation in Part A and Part B, I might not ever have thought of trying to get work out of the system. But in fact, I can. Okay. So let's keep going. Um, oops, it looks like there's a typo there. Sorry for that, guys. It says we could have gotten 400 or 43.5 kilojoules of useful work out of the system. That should be 435, not 43.5. I hope you'll forgive me if I don't uh, back up and uh, change this recording. Okay, but you might be asking yourself, going from 1 to 2, I'm compressing from the state point 1 to 2. How in the world could I have gotten uh, work out of the process? And we'll talk a little bit more about this in the upcoming days, but if you can imagine any reversible process going from 1 to 2, um, it will have that maximum useful work. So the actual process is constant pressure. Exergy says you're not interested in what the process is necessarily. You're interested in starting at 1 and ending at 2 and doing it reversibly. Okay? So there's ways to go from 1 to 2 other than this straight pressure line and if you do it reversibly, you can actually get work out of the system and having, instead of having to put it in. Okay? That's one place where students get confused. The reversible work out of the process is not going from 1 to 2 along that line. It's going from 1 to 2 somehow that's reversibly. This way, obviously, was not the reversible way to do it. So more on that to come. Okay, so part E says, let's forget we know anything about exergy and calculate these quantities using a CONAPS approach. So if I'm going to do that, I need the heat transfer out of the system, and then I have to calculate the entropy generation using the accounting of entropy. So this is a multi-step process. Uh, we do this, one, for our sanity to make sure that our numbers make sense, and two, to show us the utility of exergy, that we can do this in one step instead of having to break it down into two steps, which is what we're doing here. Okay, so here's our system going from 1 to 2. Probably uh, better illustrated, here's our system at 1. Here's our system in between 1 and 2. He transferred and work interact with the surroundings. And then finally, there's our system at state point 2. So if it's not clear from the first picture, which is the kind of picture I would expect you to draw, hopefully the three pictures that follow make it clear that we're dealing with a finite time uh, system uh, or a closed system undergoing a finite time process. Conservation energy looks like this. The change in energy going from 1 to 2 is the heat transfer in minus the work out. Okay? Ignoring kinetic and potential energies, I have delta E is delta U instead. Solving that guy for Q, I get this equation. And finally, putting that in terms of mass and specific internal energies, there's my heat transfer into the system. I've already calculated all these quantities. I calculated the work, U1 and U2, I've already found when I found those exergies, and the mass is given to me. So I plug and chug, and I find that the work, or I'm sorry, the heat transfer into the system is minus 2202 kilojoules. Okay, or I found another way, the work out of the system was 2202. So finally, let's use the accounting of entropy to uh, calculate the entropy generation. Notice the entropy generation happens inside the system, and entropy crosses the system boundary because of heat transfer. This is, once again, a closed system undergoing a finite time process, so the system starts at 1. Entropy is generated during the process from 1 to 2. Some entropy is uh, transported out, and here's our state point 2 after the process has occurred. 
So my accounting of entropy reduces to the change in entropy of the system is the entropy that came in via heat transfer plus the entropy generated. Since I have heat transfer out, I have minus Q out over T uh, for my Q in over T. Please notice that I'm using absolute temperature here. This must be in kelvins. And also notice that, that temperature is the temperature of the boundary where the heat transfer crosses. It's being exchanged with the environment. That temperature is not the temperature of the system. It is the temperature of the environment itself. OK, so solving this for S gen, I get M delta little s plus Q out over T of the environment. Once again, plugging and chugging. That's also uh, absolute temperature, just to remind you. I get 1.74 kilojoules per Kelvin for my S gen. Multiply that booger by T0, the temperature of the environment. Also making sure that I use absolute temperature there. I get the irreversibility as 523 kilojoules. So the irreversibility is the lost work. That is the additional work that I could have gotten out of the system but didn't because I didn't do things reversibly. So you're probably asking yourself, well, didn't we already calculate that number? Not quite. We calculated the maximum useful work out of the system and then the work that we actually got out of the system. If we subtract those two numbers from parts B and C, we get exactly 523 kilojoules. Okay, so the re irreversibility is the difference between the maximum useful work and the actual useful work that I could get out of the system. And good for us, that number matches. We did everything OK. So hopefully you see that this exergy approach is very useful. And it's a time saver, too. I can do energy and entropy concepts in one equation. So let's review the key concepts that uh, we learned in this example. First off, we emphasized time and again what exergy was. And that's the maximum amount of useful work that you can get out of a closed system as it reaches equilibrium with the environment. And it's only allowed to exchange heat with the environment. Useful work, another thing that we ran across, is the work out of the system, but it's the work out of the system above and beyond what is uh, done against the atmosphere. In other words, you have to subtract the work done against the atmosphere from actual work to get how much of the work is useful. Okay. Another big thing, when you're calculating exergy, you have to be careful of uh, what the stuff is at the dead state versus the properties of the surroundings themselves. Let's emphasize that looking at this equation for specific exergy. All of those properties are the properties of your stuff at state point one. All of those properties, properties of your stuff, at T and P of the surroundings. They are not the properties of the surroundings. Uh, the irreversibility is the lost work. It can also be interpreted, and this is a, a way we're going to see when we look at the full-blown accounting of exergy, it is how much exergy was destroyed in a process. And last, but certainly not least, dot, dot, dot is an ellipsis.